All right, let's fuck it. Just do it live. I'm going to do it. Fuck it. Thing. Sick. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well, keep recording then and do yeah. your thing. Yeah, I guess today we're going to talk about 3D scanning stuff. Yeah, not even modeling. We're not even going to get into that. I think we're going to save that for next week. Yeah, right? yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, because so, it's, this is already a broad enough topic. You know, we, trying we tried, to tie it all together is going to be a disaster. Well, cut, we'll cut the shit. We'll say we already tried to talk about this once, and Dave screwed up the recording. Yeah, this is a redo, <laughs> so maybe this will help. Maybe, <laughs> oh, okay. maybe we'll be more on topic. Maybe right. uh, so. We all missed. I stuff. think we'll uh, see. It'll be yeah. interesting. But first, we got to do the we need the weekly Dave's roundup admission of guilt. Oh. Dave's admission of guilt, but yeah. that's yeah, uh, well, for well, sometimes you win. That's true. I'm really good at losing. Yeah. But we'll do the R with the uh, the trials bike. <laughs> uh, I'm still losing on the trials bike. Well, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. So uh, now that we've had an additional week in between, yeah, uh, I have most additional of the parts. problems. <laughs> additional problems. Oh yeah, I forgot all about the wheel. So <laughs> <laughs> I got the motor together. Whole big fiasco because like the pistons in a different spot. I had to machine some things. I don't think you explained whatever why you took it apart. Or what the oh, reason? Yeah, I guess it, it was overheating, but yes. I don't think they know why. So I bought a trials bike because I really wanted one. I rode it once at Kevin's, and it overheated. And turns out the overheating was caused by the water pump sprocket no longer being there. <laughs> I think it's my fault, but it's also really old, so who's to know? But it's a plastic <laughs> gear up against the crank and there's like two little metal keyways and the plastic gear is gone and i found pieces of it jammed between other gears why do you think they made it out of plastic i think to save the like expensive crank gears right and just, a, a, just a, that's their failure point yeah yeah which it's a way better failure point sure. or like a it could likely to split the case too yeah. it's on the other side of the case unsupported out in no man's land mm -hmm. but so long story short it turns out it needed a clutch too that now that i've dug into it super far i've realized but um, the clutches kind of drag on them. They're known for that. And so some guys, I remember reading about, like, changed the fluid to ATF, and it helped. So I swapped ATF before bringing it to Kevin's. In the process, I was on the phone, not paying attention, and I mixed up my ATF bottle with my <laughs> acetone bottle. And then when I refilled it, so I had, like, a half a bottle of acetone, and I filled it with ATF and then put the concoction in there. And I think that did bad things to the nylon. See, a side note, uh, acetone is not kind to plastics. No, acetone and plastics don't often get along, or paint. It's pretty bad at a lot or, of things. Or lubricating metal. Or, lu well, or no, because yeah. I inadvertently made a great penetrant, though. Acetone oh, yeah. and acetone ATF, ATF is, an is awesome. supposedly the end-all, be-all, like, yeah. you know, you know, Trump's PB blaster, all that stuff. It's a way worse-smelling yeah. PB blaster. Yeah. But so yeah, I dug into it for all that. Turns out the engine cases, which are magnesium, because race car stuff built in the '90s for motorcycles was magnesium, and it's corroded on the bottom because no one really took care of this thing. So now I have another set of engine cases, which were wrong, which are very close to the same. <laughs> I thought they're supposed to be the same, and then the the cylinder jug doesn't fit into the bottom of the cases quite right. So I machined that in the mill at work. And then I put all that together and realized they clocked the whole piston forward five degrees on the motor compared to the other ones. So now everything's interfering in a different way, which is fine because the exhaust is a little weird anyway. So I cut that up and made it work and made some new brackets. And yeah, so everything else I've touched on it has also gone to shit per usual. So, so it'll like, be back together what, next week, right? Yeah, well, It should then, be together this weekend, assuming say, my stuff uh, shows up tomorrow. It could be back together tomorrow. Yesterday, mm -hmm. you decided to replace the front tire. That yeah, was, uh, that, that was one of the things I like. I knew when I bought it is it needed a front tire. Right. So That's fine. Easy. Yeah, whatever. Ish. Easy front tire. Great. Pulled that off. They're not supposed to be tubed. It had a tube in it. And that's the first sign that stuff's not great with these things. Um, and then the rim, like, if you kept it at the bottom of the ocean forever, it would look better <laughs> than it currently does. <laughs> like, I was with a screwdriver flaking off, like, six-inch-long strips of the rim. And it's all just death white powder of aluminum. Oh. and On the inside. On the inside. Yeah, the are outside gonna, looks mint. Are you just going to go straight for another tube? I already gonna... ordered two tubes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> because so. the inside corrosion is going to poke holes through them. Well, well, you scrape it all off. Yeah, but... I scrape a bunch of it off, but like it's never going to be tubeless ever again. Because that won't yeah. seal. Yeah. So, And then I bought some like vulcanizing tape oh, that's yeah. like inch and a half wide. So I'm going to try to do a couple strips of that instead. Mm -hmm. And hopefully that kind of makes up the difference. And... 
I don't know. We're gonna jam it back together. It only needs to hold like these things were on super low pressure, yeah. like way under ten pounds. All the grips, so, none of the speed. Yeah, yeah. just low, low pressure stuff. So yeah, but yeah, everything's just every step forward is at least two back. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, well, obviously we've been ranting for the last five minutes. Oh, what, weren't you paying attention, Dave? Do we not keep we're you not, engaged? We're not done ranting. Oh, yeah, no. You know that. that was just my That was rant. one out of three. That, hey, this is episode seven, I guess, again. 7.5. 7.5? 7.5. Rev 2? Yeah. Uh, my bad. I mean, we might release the recording. Of we should call it Rev 2. So. I mean, after all, we are trying to dig into the technical CAD sort of stuff. So, yeah. It would be suitable, I feel like. Yeah, Rev 2. Rev 2. But yeah, well, what's your? We're in the the Mazda den here, so <laughs> yeah, it's a uh, Maserati has uh, made some progression. Um, obviously, I guess I'm not gonna bother going over what the current scenario is because I think I went over that last episode. But um, I think I finally made a decision on how to proceed. Uh, so now I have two Mazda Speed Sixes. Uh, that was not the plan at all, but my buddy show. Made me an offer I could not refuse. <laughs> and in exchange for doing some labor, swapping some parts, and uh, a couple other things, I acquired a whole nother chassis, car, shell, if you want to call it that. Um, it's and, a motor. A built, it's and a built motor. It's not, so It's not a shell. It's a, it's not drove a, it's it not here. It's a full car. drove it here, and it did drive until I took it apart. But <laughs> It's not a shell. It's a car. So now both of them are apart. Um, originally I was thinking, cause I only, I just wanted to sell mine. I didn't want to, I just wanted to sell mine, get it gone, buy a truck. Uh, but now I have two and, uh, my original intent was just to steal the motor out of the other running and driving one, jam it in mine, sell it. But now I have three motors, coincidentally, um, the blown up one, the built one. And then after doing some research, realizing that, uh, like a two, five Ford, um, NA motor, uh, or bottom end, I should be more specific, uh, swaps in with relatively no modifications. Um, and they're super cheap because they were in everything. They were in Fusions, uh, Ford Escapes, and a couple other things. They, well, they were in a couple Mazdas, like the NA Mazdas, uh, CX-5s, and regular non-speed 6s. So anyways, it was like they're cheap. Picked up a whole you know motor assembly from the local LKQ for 250 bucks. Um, gonna swap heads to the turbo stuff and I think jam that in the car that I intend to sell. And now I have a built motor and a rust-free car to do other things with. And hopefully I sell my car and still acquire a truck. So anyways, things are busy in the garage. We've got three motors, one, two, kind of taken apart and trying to keep things semi-organized, but I think I have a plan moving forward, so that's a start. <laughs> so that's, that's where I'm at, making a mess. My turn now, Kevin? Yeah, yeah. Kevin's oh, turn. Yeah, yeah. Kevin's in full uh, garage prep mode still. Full barn. But full barn, yeah. whatever you want. It's, still, it's a garage, I don't know. But got the ceiling insulation done a couple weeks ago. Got first session of floor coating down last weekend so this weekend gets the last third or this week maybe hopefully um so once i get the floor done once it's all epoxied and everything i can not worry about having to have too much stuff in there that i have to move around to coat the floor with so it's pretty much game on from that point so we etched and we etched last weekend yeah. Check it out on the gram. And then you laid down epoxy after 24 hours last weekend. Right. On one, oh, two-thirds maybe? Yeah, two-thirds of the barn. Yeah. I ended up getting more coating out of the 500 square feet thing that it was supposed to be. And after doing a couple rows, I was kind of like, oh, crap. Like, I'm using way less of this than I should be. And I started putting on thick. And I still got two-thirds of a 1,200 square foot barn done. So I only have one third left so hopefully one more kit but it, it didn't come out great but i'm kind of happy it didn't come out great there's some spots where it had moisture on top probably because the humidity probably because i didn't let it dry enough i don't know but it, it finally dried and seems cured enough but i, 
I guess I'm glad because now I'm not really met, like scared to screw it up with stuff. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if Did I, you end up having to buy more sealant? I bought five because five boxes of the stuff because it said on fresh concrete it would absorb more, but yeah. mm. it didn't. So I returned three of them and or two of them. So I have three yeah. total. So you know, six hundred ish bucks in coating twelve hundred square feet isn't that bad. That's not bad at all. Um, no, it's so worth doing. Yeah, it looks really it's nice. Once once it's all done and everything, and you're just kind of like moving around, you're not going to notice the imperfections and stuff. And and like you said, you're going to drop stuff right. on it anyway. Mm -hmm. So now you get that out of the way. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I remember so, the the shop the floors at ECS, the white ones, yeah. pure white. When that first yeah. got done, it was like the biggest deal. If you like did a little chip or a nick, I mean now they're kind of screwed but yeah three years later four years later and it's just not you can't hold white epoxy up for anything I mean, the, no. the theory is good you know it reflects the most light so yeah. you know working underneath cars you know the lightest color I mean, epoxy you can put on a floor even is just putting best, this but... gray epoxy down at the blue black and white paint chip mm -hmm. flake and everything it, it still is nice and bright in there yeah, so. yeah it makes a huge difference you know but yeah, you're gonna chip it. You're gonna drop a brake rotor trying to get it off the car and Sooner put a big later, yeah. ding in the floor. It's yeah, it's gonna happen. It's not a big deal. So, other last thirds going on sometime this week. So hopefully then I can start making workbenches and actually start working in there. Ready to put the bring the E36 home, finally, and our first drift event potentially at Midvale on the seventh. Midvale's not happening now, right? We don't it's know. Just pit don't race. Know. We don't know. We're still still, That's up, still in the air. up in the air. Really? I thought it was it was nope. happening. They took money. Then it was like uh, not happening. Now it's been it's, maybe. It's, it's, it's still, in the maybe. It's okay, still in the maybe. It's still in the maybe. Okay. But uh, other than that, last week I brought up finishing up the sim rig and finally like mm -hmm. painting it with the the steel it paint, which is liquid stainless steel in a can. And we kind of rambled on for a while about how good that stuff is. <laughs> yeah. It's it is it's, so good. it's kind of expensive, but it's worth the money. Twenty five dollars a can, roughly, for you know a sixteen ounce spray paint aerosols, can. Yeah. And that comes in silver and black. For, there's other versions you can get the full spray gun stuff but if you want something that you fabricated to come out real nice hit it with a wire wheel and shoot it with a can of steel it because it comes out amazing every time and then you can weld it afterwards and right, touch so it up and everything and it touches up really well yeah. and the finish it just comes out so it's people who aren't great. familiar with that product and even the fact that certain paints are weldable I was gonna say the appeal and the reason that this stuff is expensive is it's liquid stainless steel right, right. It, it it has yeah stainless it's in got the a, enough metallic in it where you can still strike an arc and actually get a decent weld mm -hmm. through it it doesn't yeah. act funny and pop and bang. and i would presume everything else the fact that the, whatever gives it pigment and you know adhesion and all that other stuff is somehow semi weld compatible you yeah know, i mean it it's never going to be as good off. as a clean it's weld as, it's but. volatile enough that it burns off quick enough that you can tig or mig on it and it's halfway decent um right. so it's really appealing especially if you're dealing with like bodywork stuff which you're doing now Ugh. and being able to paint the inside of quarters and fenders and you know yeah, well anywhere primers and everything are you doing it deal. in stages like that where mm -hmm. parts overlap others that's yeah. a great option. anytime you're fabricating it's yeah it's good or to even have. want to get some paint on something that you intend on adding on to later you know, yeah. Um, anyway. That's the worst. Is letting something, a project, sit around in the garage. It's just like unpainted, and you know, it's just gonna flash rust and be horrible to clean up later. So, anyways, it, yeah, you can't just like was, you can't just throw like primer on that and then you know go weld it later. You have to clean it all off. That's again. the biggest problem yeah. with like uh, body work and everything is that once you do clean metal body work, whether it be patch panels or whatever, is getting a sealant or a primer or something like that on top of it. And then you have to just take it down later anyways. They do have weld through primers, but they, they always do. sort of suck. But that's primers don't seal either. Exactly. They're so. not a sealant, so they are porous, so they will absorb moisture and then rust again, which so. is... It's all, it's all a worst. nightmare, all that stuff. I hate thinking about body work. But <laughs> yeah. the point behind this stuff was, while expensive, super just capable, I mean, you it's blast it on anything, you can... It's the practical option compared to like having your stuff galvanized, dipped once you're done. Oof. Like that's yeah. that's the only thing better. Right. And that's a lot less feasible. Yeah, especially being able to buy it in an aerosol can is what's yeah. up. A lot more cost efficient to buy it in a can than it is to have it galvanized. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> but boy, do I want to have that done. Ooh, it's just like a the fresh warm chassis fuzzies. acid dip, like strip out all the seam sealers yeah. and everything, and then just have watch the thing drive into redone. the little swimming pool and come out God. really pretty. 
That'd be so nice. <laughs> He's so excited. Dave, what's your project update? How's the Rado? Uh, it's all right. Uh, so the other day I was driving it and it was hot, of course. Uh, typical 90 Volkswagens. Oh, I thought you were talking about Ohio weather. Well, it was hot. <laughs> well, it was both. It was hot outside. It was, it like was 90, spicy out the other day. It was like 90 degrees, and I yeah. was like, oh, I'll go for a drive. So I go for a drive. And I've had an intermittent issue with the fuel pump here and there, and it's been Same. a big, it's been, like, been a big headache. Uh, and I've just neglected to do it because I've just been lazy. Um, so the other day I was driving it, and at wide open throttle on the highway on the way home, it decided it just wanted to shut off in the middle of the highway at 60 miles an hour. That's the best. <laughs> so I coasted pretty... over, and... You know, let it sit for a second, start it back up, got back home. Uh, pulled the fuel pump out, uh, looked at it. It's the original fuel pump from 93. I'm surprised that you were able to cool it down and get going again. Well, no. It, Actually, I once they die, happen. they just kind of die. Uh, yeah, so, but I have had a similar thing happen, like, once. More often than not, they just die. But. Yeah. Uh, so I got it home and pulled the fuel pump out. It's the original pump from 93. Uh, the connections on the pump are actually like crusty brown. I was gonna say everything has probably got to be looking pretty brown pretty, in there. Yeah, <laughs> pretty burnt, uh, and the rubber seal that actually sits at the bottom of the swirl pot, uh, non-existent, completely gone. So I had to fiddle fuck around and pull, uh, <laughs> pull the rubber seal out of the bottom of the gas tank and try to peel pieces out of that. So hope that's... you hope you used all the gas up in the tank. Yeah, <laughs> mine shit always dies with a full tank, so you're elbow deep. Oh, no, but, it's full. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Every time. I mean, Every yeah, time. I mean, why, why would it be easy? Uh, so that's just what I'm working on. I ordered a pump from Rock Auto on Wednesday, and it got here this morning. So that's probably what I'll go do after we finish up here. But um, I would assume that's 90% of the issue that it's having. Uh, the other Couldn't issue, hurt anyways. It's one of those things. Once you're at place hit, it's, like... It's one of the only things I haven't yeah. really touched on the car just because I was like, yeah, it works. Oh, you let it ride, I, for yeah. sure. Yeah, you don't replace fuel pumps for no reason. No, Run to failure. So, uh, yeah. That, I, might, I might pull the intake manifold off and kind of just clean stuff up and clean all the goop out of it. Been Get ready for show season in August or something. Something. I don't know. <laughs> When I heard that, yeah. but other than that, uh, I don't know. My buddy's doing stuff on his E30, and he's got the whole rear end apart. He's putting bushings in the the bushings and all kinds of other silly stuff, waiting for his AR. Is that Parker? Yeah, Parker's E30. Yeah. yeah. So he's been sitting around, and I've been watching him sit there and do that. And but he can't do much when you got to wait on parts. So um, I feel that. But other than that, I haven't done much. I drove up the Mark IV the other day. Wow. For the first time, in like. I don't know, a fucking while. And of course it made all kinds of cringy noises. <laughs> yeah, and I was like, it's Mark IV, it's fine. It, it just sits in the driveway anyway. So. Well, other than that, that's about all the products that I'm working on. You're moving your face all over the place. Can you hear yeah, yourself? No. I've been curious. Okay. What do you mean? You can't hear yourself? I can. I okay. Can hear I was just making sure. I'm trying that new mic setup. What? Well, the the, the vertical mic, yeah. Mm-hmm. We're, we're right. questioning. Um, yeah. Okay, well, I guess we're going to get into three scanning things now, the daily ramblings the topic, are over with. Yeah. The yeah. topic of today, yeah. So, what we kind of gathered is a lot of people don't really know what 3D scanning is. Because oh. it looks yeah. like, yeah, you just like scan a thing and then you have this nice, useful like pile of data. But that's not the case, because yeah. we deal with this every day. So, so what we... First, first and foremost, what are the like three biggest, I guess... Um, project types we use 3D scanning for. Uh, should we start there? I feel like we should start with what 3D scanning actually is. Yeah, okay. I agree. Yeah, Let's go right. with what we'll it is. That. Okay. <laughs> so all the things you yeah, want to do. Yeah, Great so, suggestion, guys. <laughs> I guess I'll try to explain this. 3D scanning is uh, basically just millions of data points that are collected Referred by... Referred to as a point cloud. Right. Yep. Collected by a camera that is triangulated with a laser... At a known lasers. distance, yeah, um, and basically all those points are are just collected as individual data points based on a uh, known coordinate system, right? More often than not, yes. I mean, some machines don't have a known coordinate system. Like mm-hmm. we use a ferro well, arm with a yeah, scanner. So normally they. If, if they don't have a known coordinate system, they're using reference points to come up right, with Right, you have to like continuously move a, a, along the right. part. If it has a, a movable that... arm, it uses encoders 
right. run kind of like tandem with uh, yeah to create the, the an laser XY coordinate system to and the cameras you know, correlate uh, with it. There's a lot of the more affordable 3D scanners out there are like a fixed. They have at least one fixed axis or degree of freedom, where they either you know you put them on a tripod or something like that. They might spin around or they might just scan whatever's in front of them. And then that kind of like limits that you wouldn't use encoder data or anything like that. Oh, there's a guy who this, has a the, um, the OG mini bike. I know that. Yes, yeah. it's the <laughs> regular bicycle that has retrofitted or that's you know, one of those clutch sound. Oh, yeah, you, that you, brings you know, me back to God. the child. It's got the little yeah. motor. It's it's got got the red, the red mini bike with the little what, black leather seat. The black, yeah, the, the just a flat yeah. seat and then the two bent up hoops. Yeah, boy, have I been through some stuff on those. Anyway, sorry, we got everything that a 3D scanner. The flashbacks. Everything that a 3D scanner collects is just points everything beyond yep. that is doesn't just really post, matter how they collect them but. it's all post processing after that um, whether the software itself does it like ours does at this point didn't somewhat oh, yeah. it didn't a while ago but now it does where you can live scan and mesh points into surfaces where it triangulates it takes the average of the data of the points it's getting i don't know it, if i would call it a surface just yet it's well, it turns into a surface when you... It yeah, it's not a, a graphical it's surface. It's not a surface it's a graphical, as we refer to it. It's like a graphical representation. Yeah. Okay, so you have a million points on the surface. It takes the average of that stuff. Whether, it, you know, there's going to be minor deviations in everything. Mm -hmm. There has to be. Yeah, mm -hmm. weird. Because um, this all works based on reflectivity, right? Right. So, I mean, you, need, you can't have the perfect, like, black body thing that absorbs all light and expect a 3D scanner to pick it up. So you need something that has They've, somewhat... Yeah, they've come a long way because yeah. it used to be really shitty. Yeah, our, our OG 3D scanner was what we refer to as a, a red line laser. Right, so the that early ferro-arm ferro yeah. laser scanner. And yeah. anything that wasn't like... Gloss? Forget yeah. about it. Flat white was the only thing Flat that Flat colors really liked. was the perfect, like the, well, not perfect, but, you know, our best attempt at getting, like, reliable scan data. Uh, but since then, you know, technology's come a long way in just a couple of years, and uh, now that we use blue line lasers, and they have a much better time with glossy surfaces. But unless it's like a night, if you just like cut and buffed your black trunk lid, oh, it's over. It's, it's still bad to see yeah, anything. Yeah. Even yeah. even now, gloss black's not a good thing. It just absorbs the light that it's trying to pick right. up. So makes sense. I mean, black is and reflects all, all colors. Over the place. And, yeah, uh, heavy metallics have also had issues with it. Just gives you a bunch of spots all no man's land. Mm -hmm. right. So, so if you're like scanning, so like obviously gloss black anything, right? Are you more likely to pick up the reflections that are in that than you are to actually pick? Up well, the the, the point was is it just kind of freaks out the camera a little bit. You get kind of false signals. Yeah. There's reflection filters that yeah. they try to put in place, but you can only do so much. So we, in the past with old lasers, we've used solutions like spraying things with weld developer, which yeah. basically is just a, like a matte white. Yeah, it doesn't really so matter that it's weld developer. It's, it's just sprayable kind of like baby a, powder, essentially. Yeah, like it yeah. just leaves something you can wipe back off easily. Yeah. Okay. This easily. works really well for us for like body panels. It's not going to damage the paint or anything like that. But So once you get a graphical mesh of what you are trying to you know look at model then mm -hmm. you can start the post processing of that data because you can't just scan something and then throw it in cad software and expect to do a lot with it really right, so that's what you always that's see like, like that's that's originally you can do some i mean if we're trying to really cut corners and just we just want to see where a hose is well. and not really have to work what so we don't cut corners. It's not cutting corners. No, no, no. Like, okay, so I'm sorry. In the design yeah. process, being able to, like, <laughs> if you know what your goal is, right, right, you don't need to go through and make this scan data perfect. You know, right. you don't need to post-process it for hours because, I mean, realistically, it takes hours to make that, like, a usable surface. You can just, you can at, stop at this point, and you could bring it into a software and say, I just, I just want to visually see where this hose goes or something like that, and that you, but you can work with other um, primitive uh, it's still, features. It's still difficult. <laughs> you really still have to do some post processing because you, need, bit, you yeah. need some yeah, you type need of something. feature. We can so we with what we have now, you can back out things like cylinders or planes, mm -hmm. and if you have that as a reference point to like orient things and set up your own coordinate system for this, so that it makes sense. So mm -hmm. it's not like a coordinate system fifty feet away at some weird angle. You know, your front view needs to be kind of 
what you're trying to... I like to, uh, especially when a car is on a lift, I like to either scan or just probe the floor Yeah, no, that, to, get a, to get a plane there. That's which is a really, really good reference, especially yeah. for things that are... For, like body styling, yeah. lips, yeah. and you know, diffusers you sure and stuff. So I spoiler. threw out the word earlier, primitive features, and what we refer to as primitive features are... Like planes you know, and just, circles. And yeah, the... basic geometry, and we can either probe that with our arms, which is a whole other topic, but or extract that from the scanned data. You can say, hey, this is a cylinder, uh, fit a cylinder to this, and then it just shoots you out a, a right. cylinder that right. works Whether well. It averages like off software. of that yep. you know, layer that you is can, created from the point cloud. You can mm -hmm. dial that in for maximum, best, or mm -hmm. minimum fit type things. Or so if you measured it with calipers, you could say, this is what it is. And right, it you can give just... it an exact number, and then it'll pick the average of where it is to give you a location, which mm -hmm. is nice. Yeah. So then, bam, you have some features to reference to, to work off of. as a separate file too yeah. essentially you don't need the scan data itself at that point but it's really nice for kind of like i said well you, you shouldn't call it a shortcut need but, need it, but yeah, yeah it's you need to know like where the you know if there's a, a hose clamp yeah, if you just that go on a crash turbo, into something or that's whatever. a really good option yeah but you know I, what i'm trying to say is like if you have a turbo outlet or something you're trying to make a silicon hose for it you need to know, okay, you need to know the cylinder diameter, but you also need to see kind of where the, the rib on the turbo itself stops so you can mm -hmm. not make your hose too long or too short and have, like, the right length right. to make it fit well, mm -hmm. right? basically. Um, the only reason I interrupted you is because I just felt like that was a potential stopping point where we may choose to stop using 3D scan data. Yeah, more often than not, like, depending on what I'm doing, but if I'm doing, like, a skid plate or something, I very rarely take much info, like create many things in Polyworks. I don't create many features. I'll create a couple planes. We, yeah, but I mean, if we didn't have the option to mesh, you could take that point cloud right into SolidWorks and probably be just fine. I usually bring it in as just a graphical representation, which, um, you know, if you do it with the older SolidWorks, you can do. It's not a tangible surface. For most God. things, is fine. I still hate SolidWorks for that. Yeah, how they brought it in, and now it can bog your computer down depending on your settings. Really bad. But for because if you're extracting data from a car, say you have the bolts and there's a nice washer there, and you can create a circle off that, and you do that for all the bolts on a skid plate. Yeah, if you know where you want to mount random something. Random numbers. Yeah. That's the the trouble that I have a mental block with, is you know that's you're somewhere in the tolerances of the factory plate. The German things, especially at least from my experience with the BMW brand, they like to pick even numbers for their bowl spacing so nice <laughs> so like if they i'll make a plane and i'll hand sketch out my circles near that mm -hmm. so i'll know it's pretty close and i'll pick whatever the closest number is that's real and more often than not that's right oh that burned me so bad we talked about the uh intake manifold that i was doing for uh, mqb the, stuff a while back that was and a so, tight pattern, so i had scanned but... that and extracted you know all the different features and everything the bolt pattern on the head for the flange of the intake manifold and, you know, came up with just some real just kind of goofy numbers, you know, 67.5 millimeters between these two bolts. And I'm like, nah, they mean 68. And so, like, you know, I took those liberties in, like, different places. And it was completely wrong. I had to go back to the scan data. It was what the scan data said. So, I mean, half a millimeter is pretty good. If it's, like, 0. 0.568, I'm, then, yeah, okay. I'm, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm riffing five. here. I'm, I'm not <laughs> saying that's exactly what it was. But, you know, I took some liberties because it just didn't make any sense to me. Like, eh, it's probably right, not and that's, this weird, odd number. That's you know? the barrier that you have to deal with when you're post-processing all this yeah. stuff is what is a real number and what is within the tolerance of either the way you scanned it or where the part is on the car. Like, most subframes on modern cars are kind of floating to the point where like you loosen them and part of your alignment is you can shift the subframe around to get numbers yep. within spec yep. so you can't even go off that bolt because the bolt is what's the bolt centered right yeah. the subframe moves so there's a lot of features like that that if you just blindly extract circles and mm -hmm. cylinders off of things and use that to make your part it'll fit that one car yeah but then if you bring in any other car it might not fit yeah there are yeah. a lot of considerations so you really have to pay attention to that. It can really burn you. Yeah. Either in either direction, whether you're guesstimating that no, it should have been a normal number, yeah. or <laughs> turns you know, out it shouldn't have been a normal number. <laughs> right. That's more rare than my experience, at least. Again, but, it was just because I assumed that I was like, because it, it, it was a bolt pattern, you know, for right. for a flange, and I'm thinking it's 
bolt spacing is, I'm sure, the same between all the bolts, but it just wasn't. The bolts... They, you, if you think the, about it, the guy designing it probably had the center line there, and it's the middle of, in between two ports or something. Yeah, a guy had already and, designed coolant jackets or something like that, and he's like, oh, shit, I gotta move this bolt over a millimeter or something yeah, like this that. Is, yeah, 1.35 <laughs> millimeters, and you're like, Damn oh. it. <laughs> <laughs> And now it's my problem. <laughs> How frequently does that happen? I mean, all the time. Every I mean, project we yeah. do, there's some sort of I mean, it's an educated guess, yeah, but we some, are making some guesswork Something you there. feel out over time. You learn to know which projects I mean, be. a common question that we get asked is, you know, when you finish designing a project, whether it be with scan data or not, um, you know, how confident are you in the design? And I mean, we have, fortunately, access to 3D printers and scanners and all that stuff. Yeah. And I mean, I would never feel like really comfortable spending a lot of money placing like a full production order for something that we had designed based solely off of scan data because again you, done it. It, it depends, depends on what it is it depends so much on the post processing and how you interpret the data how you mesh it how you do all these things and I'm I mean yeah at, at this point I pretty much nailed down cosmetic we things. We have a really good idea. The cosmetic stuff cosmetics I agree Cosmetic's a different with. story. Yeah. So, yeah that's the other side of things right yeah. so you can take your scan data from say a trunk lid or something and you can post process it to turn it into actual surfaces that can be referenced by 3d modeling software so then you can go and say you want a general shape of something and kind of model what you want like a spoiler past where those surfaces go and then you can cut them with the exact surface that it's going to be made right. it to so as long as your model is correct and as long as the part comes in as close right. to that model as possible, it's going to fit almost right. guaranteed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So, high confidence there. Right, well, but that type of product line, that it yeah, works, works very well. Yeah, I don't remember the last time I had a spoiler that didn't fit. Yeah, I was going to say, well, I mean, yeah, we that kind of jumped into a hole. Only if it doesn't come in and meets the part you designed. Right. right. So, that so, happens often. And that really, there's, there's a gap there, right? So, like, you can take all the data that you have, and they really, it fitting really depends on the manufacturer that's producing it, right? That's right. It's, it's both. I mean, we've definitely had stuff come in that meets exactly what we designed and didn't fit because right. we either missed something or, you know, we're mm -hmm. test fitting on a different car and something changed that we didn't foresee. Yeah. So it's... It's hit or miss. I mean, that, yeah. that's any, any production part that's being... Obviously, it's more frustrating from our perspective when oh, yeah. the vendor comes in and it's out by six millimeters off of what we told them to make or what mm -hmm. our file that we sent was. Right. Because they're like, well, what the heck? We had it right. right. You didn't even look at my... You didn't even check. Yeah, but you just made it off the top of your head. Yeah. Mistakes happen on both ends. It's... Yeah. Well, I was going to say, so I think we got off on like a little bit of a tangent and that we, I, so I, it was kind of my fault, I think, but I paused Kevin there when we got to the point where, you know, from the scan data, we, you know, generate a point cloud, you generate a graphical mesh. And yeah. from there, I mean, specifically yeah. the cosmetic stuff that we were talking about, yeah. you can, that's when we need step further. so much more post-processing, and that's where a lot of the time... You can take it further into what, at least for PolyWorks, our, the program we use for post-processing is called NURBING surfaces, which mm -hmm. is basically creating a mesh based off of specific points that are fitted to that graphical data, mm -hmm. and you're, you're basically fitting squares or you know surfaces that have certain amount of flexibility to right. them which you define i mean you say right. how far how essentially how smooth this can be like hey put this little patch on here like you're making a quilt or something right. like that right and you tell it how flexible that can be to fit and on a granular level like none of this is perfect at all if you look at it as super yeah, microscopic level yeah. it's it's like <laughs> looks like the rocky mountains but then you you have to back out something that's usable and practical from there yeah so i mean obviously it'll molecular level or whatever like nothing no, everything no, looks like no yeah, yeah right. everything looks like the rocky mountains yeah, yeah. Uh, so. and and honestly these the the scanning hardware that we use specifically the ferro arm but pretty much anything else has such a high tolerance i mean we're talking about thousandths of a millimeter i think yeah, accuracy i think that's when you have a good surface I'm saying when it starts yelling at you, you're it's still less than a quarter of a millimeter when it it's far so less than a quarter of a millimeter, which is our errors. general tolerance for things. Um, so so back to yeah. So generally, after you guys get your scan in, right? Uh, obviously, I've heard mentions of multiple per programs here, right? There's SolidWorks, there's PolyWorks. Yeah, we're trying to not even get into CAD software yet. Right. Well, we're well, just talking I'm about just, the sort of you scanning, you know, but obviously. 
they're used for the different things or, yes. or like so What's we're designing we design strictly in SolidWorks. Right. Um, and then we use PolyWorks to interface with all the 3D scanning with the, the ferro arm okay. to back out all the data. There's a couple different facets of PolyWorks, depending on what you're doing. Like what Kevin's saying with nerving, there's a different facet of the program called IM Edit that we use versus you can use IM Expect if you're just doing an inspection or you know just backing out basic features like cylinders and planes. Right. So depending on what you're doing is how in depth you need to go. Right. And then, yeah, we'll export that into certain files that you can use with SolidWorks and bring it in depending on how you want to utilize that. Data. And it, it works the other way too. So when you want to inspect a part that you've designed in SolidWorks, you can scan it in PolyWorks and compare it to your CAD model that you generated in SolidWorks. So oh, you can cool. say, okay. okay, this is the part I have. This is the part I designed. It's this far off by this color map. So you can you can t you know communicate to your vendors and say mm -hmm. this is the problem this is where we need it to be fixed. That is or, super handy. So yeah, we do yeah. that via color mapping, which basically it just establishes a color correlation to a deviation. So it says, you know, if you say on a scale from zero to five millimeters, you say zero is green and five millimeters is red, and then so that overlay. You know, in a graphical representation, you can say, you know, every area that's green is dead nuts on. That's a match to the model that we generated. But, you know, colors that are closer to the yeah. red end of the spectrum, that's that's where our problem is. And Which is great because, I mean, some of these parts are dealt with through overseas vendors. Mm -hmm. And, like, having the color yeah, map is barriers a, is a big problem. You so. can just send a quick screenshot of your tolerance scale and the colors and be like, look, it's out right here. You can mm -hmm. red circle it. Yeah. And then... Yeah. Very handy. It's also, you know, that's very user dependent too because it's an optimization that's run. So you have a bunch of data points and you have to fit it to something that's known that's the CAD model, right? Right. So it runs an iteration setup and says, okay, I need to position this scan data to match the CAD model as best as possible. So there's also criteria there where you can say, I want it to fit within you know, 0.005% of whatever mm -hmm. things can be fit as well as they can be. Right. So that that's a whole... It's user... a whole other can of worms, and especially it becomes an issue when a part's auto-tolerance. Mm -hmm. So you're trying to specifically find out why it doesn't fit, mm -hmm. and it's trying to best fit to the part you designed. Right. So if it's out far enough, it's hard to distinguish exactly what's wrong. So you need to align it in certain orientations to show you what part is the interface that's messing everything up. Because right. if you get something that's like all well, super warped and you try to align it to your straight thing, oh, the yeah. software can't yeah, do that. Enough. Right. So, so you, like if you don't, if without user interface, without you defining how to fit these two pieces best together, the model and the scan data, it doesn't really know what's exactly wrong. It just tries to make everything as green as possible in terms of that graphical representation. So essentially what you can do is if you know if it's a um, like a heat shield for an airbox or something like that, you know that you have three bolts that locate this thing. You can tell the software, say, hey, you know, this is how you bolt it down. So you click like focus on these areas and then it'll fit those specific areas as best as it can and then let everything else kind of fall into place and that'll kind of that can't help you see you know where the deviations are right you can assign a priority on what it's aligning mm -hmm. so so yeah. and i mean that goes both directions i mean we kind of you know jumped from designing parts to inspecting parts uh, but you know, aligning yeah. data is important on both ends of the spectrum in terms of inspecting parts, but also designing things. Right. Um, we touched, uh, yeah, this is a great one to go on. It's like, you know, if you're scanning, to, for example, an intake. Mm -hmm. To design uh, an to intake. To design an intake. It's mostly an intake. It's mostly an intake. <laughs> mostly we use it for. Well, I mean, I've also done stuff with trunk lids and stuff, depending on the shape. Sometimes if the car comes so around. So what, what determines this is but, whether or not you need to move stuff to design a part. Right, well, you right. can't, you know, we only have so much swing. The arm is, what, a six-foot arm? Regardless of the swing, you need to know where things are when they can't be scanned. I'm saying just in terms of that, like, regardless, you only have a six-foot radius. Yeah, sure. So sometimes you have to overlap 
even if you don't have to open and close things. Yeah. But you have to be able to create features or scan enough data on either end of what you're, tr you know, if you're trying to scan something bigger than that, so that you have data to align it to. Yeah, different scanners don't have that problem necessarily if you're not using an ARM, but those are less accurate, so it's a trade-off of sure. you know, yeah, yeah. your accuracy. But like when you're designing an intake heat shield, you need to know where the the hood is because you don't want it to run into the hood, mm -hmm. but you also want like whatever bulb seal you put on top of it to kind of compress a little bit and seal off you know the hot air from the intake air and that's the whole point of a you know, cold air intake so that's why we want to design it to to seal off on the hood right so how do you know where the hood lining is when the hood's closed yeah. right you okay, can't scan so it closed so you have to scan the hood and the hood underside like outside and inside yeah. and then you have to scan the the hood with it closed and some other reference like the bumper or the headlight or something you find that something says, that's going to stay in the same spot Right, so right. It, it can say, okay, the outside of the hood is here when the bumper is here, and the inside of the hood is here when the bumper is here. So now you know where to put that bulb seal, where to put that that sheet metal all the way up to, so you get a nice seal, you get mm -hmm. the best intake you can get, essentially. I'm curious, because uh, I hadn't thought about this before, but you know how like cold air intakes was like a thing before, right? right. They would put filters down in bumpers, and it, just does, it doesn't exist anymore. It does. Yeah, some you can still. Yeah, you can more still often than not, on that. modern cars, you don't have space anymore. Yeah, that may be. Part you're not going to. You're thinking '90s Honda here, where you had exactly. space behind That's the bumper exactly to put a filter. About. I'm just still, curious to see how cars, much of that is attributed to, like, you know, the progress of this kind of technology and things like that, where it's not. I don't think you saw that intakes that sealed as nicely to the hood as you do now, right. or, oh, or no. as we're no. capable of doing. Right. Yeah. And it's strictly because of 3D scanning. Before that, what are you going to do? Pretty long time ago, that like intake tracked length. I mean, no matter what, it hurts performance. So the shorter you can make it, the better. And if you can make a cold air Assuming intake, you don't have a math, yeah. Yeah, assuming, yeah, yeah that's fair. there's other criteria involved. That's but, fair. But there's also a general perception of danger because of puddles mm -hmm. in, you know, the old cold air intake. <laughs> right. Which I always laugh at that. I, that's got to be a big puddle. <laughs> I have a personal friend that hydrolocked their motor going through a puddle with their cold air intakes sticking out their bumper. So yeah. we had uh, multiple customers at the shop I worked at with bone it. stock cars, hydrolock motors. It's so, a real thing. Yikes. <laughs> People will go through puddles. I don't understand why they're doing it. But these aren't puddles. Like, yeah. they're not puddles. No, no. these are like bone We're stock Mercedes. Small ponds. You're four yeah, feet in. This is. 2013 Hurricane Joaquin H2O puddles. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that was. That so was I never got that. That wasn't that long. Yeah, it was. No, it was. It was 2013? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> that was, it was one of those two years. I remember that was the year I went, and I have a cold air intake in quotes on the Mark IV, and I was like, I'm going to take all of this lower half off and put it back <laughs> up because I was like, I'm not going to hydro lock my motor eight hours from home. That's not a good time. No, and uh, it was, it was. I was there for that also. It was, was it was bad. Yeah. It was. Uh, I mean, what half of uh, half of Ocean City was underwater. Uh, yeah, everything from First Street to like Fifth was yeah. complete water. Yeah. There's people rafting. Yeah, there are, <laughs> like, yeah, there towing are. trucks with <laughs> rafts. Or... Oh, I miss it. Anyway, but but yeah, cold air intakes and sucking up water. Yeah. It's almost it's well, ninety percent better yeah, to. Yeah, Yes. Point was, is you can, make, you can water, make intakes well, that fit little, was, far, far better yeah. than anything that was possible in the past. I mean, unless you were an OE, like, right, you and you had know. the CAD files from right. what it was supposed to be. You wouldn't know where all these panels were supposed to be. There's no way you were an aftermarket supplier, manufacturer, or whatever, right. and to be able to make something that fit that well. Right. Keep in mind, our perspective is reverse engineering. So right. we don't have all the data off a vehicle. We're coming up with the data and trying to create everything we need to develop a product. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's a unique perspective compared to OEs or com some companies that are close-knit with the OE manufacturers. They're mm -hmm. able to get their hands on data somehow. Dynan or... Yeah, Dynan back in the day, all those guys, <laughs> like, you get really tight with a BMW or something. Yeah, send over these that files. Helps. Yeah, sure. You know, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> That would be nice. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, I mean, no, so we, so we, again, I, we keep I, going yeah, off on these like little tangents, like, you know, oh we God. started talking <laughs> about, um, you know, intakes, aesthetics and aligning data in multiple different positions. So I think, I think we got through kind of intakes and how that works. Um, 
Roughly, yeah. I mean, there's the other aspect of uh, doing your scans in sort of layers, if you think about it in terms of other programs, where you need to scan items in place and out of place. It's the same as with the hood, but like in air, the stock airbox, you need to know the real hose, estate. Which I do that very frequently with. At, yeah, it's that happens with... Because you know, I mean, you can't almost wrap, everything we do. You can't wrap this arm 360 degrees around a hose while it's installed in a car. Right. No. So, I'm just. I was thinking in terms of configurations, not in terms of scanning the whole thing. Like you need an airbox in place. You need the, the airbox not in place. You need you know this intake tube here or not there or the battery box out so you can get your bolt locations that you want to use. Mm -hmm. right. There's a bunch of different aspects you need to think of. Once you know you're getting to this, what we consider one of the first steps honestly, but isn't. You need to think ahead and know what product you're designing and right. kind of wrap your head around it before you can collect all the data you need to develop a successful part. It helps so you much. Just, you can't yeah. just scan one time, right? Because that doesn't give you anything. It depends on what you do. Very rarely. But yeah, I mean, it's rare. I mean, if you come in with a good plan and it's a product you've done before and have a good grasp on, you can do it in one shot. Yeah. But you know, if it's like a front lip or something well, I mean, like that, might as well. it's possible. Okay, yeah. but I mean, would you do it though? Think about like something like an exhaust system that's hanging on the wall over here, basically. <laughs> uh, you're gonna scan the stock exhaust because you want to know where it sits when right, exactly. the weight of the exhaust is on the hangers and where everything, how, how much clearance things have to the stuff around it. But then you also want to scan it without the exhaust attached so you know how much room you have to play with. So. Yeah. Well, it really that. depends on what you're doing. Yeah. yeah, it's tricky going from a stock two and a quarter inch of whatever exhaust yeah, to try and bump it up to three inch or something like that. I mean, you have to consider that you can't just take this stock exhaust cylinder or right. center line and just bump it out because, oh you know, God. if the factory oh. stuff fits real tight, I mean, yeah. you got to go one specific direction. So these are a lot of considerations you definitely have to make in terms of um, whether it be aligning your scan data or just extracting the features that you're going to right. work what off are you of. using for features to yeah you know, because like, yeah, yeah you can build all the cylinders you want mm -hmm. off of an exhaust and they're pretty worthless because yep, pretty much you <laughs> can't align much to to it like the exhaust tips you want in a pretty damn similar location right. ideally yeah that's great you need you know where you're connecting to at the downpipe or wherever mm -hmm. to be in its position but otherwise it's kind of a free-for-all in that case yeah so it's very dependent on product that's what we're like Skid plates, for example, I prefer to just make a plane and kind of wing it, and I will hand sketch my stuff from a perspective, and then I can move my holes accordingly. Yeah, I'll tend to back out like a few planes of like the mounting holes mounting just planes, in case to reference. Holes. Right, I usually do that just as a, if anything else, just to fix a sketch to, so I have something to dimension off of that's not going to float. Yeah. Because you know SolidWorks, that first dimension you put in that moves everything, yeah, you, <laughs> some undeterminable amount. You want everything to be fully defined, ideally. Because right. if you don't, and you try to you know, move a sketch plane around or something just a little bit, it's just a full mess. Right. If you're not familiar with SolidWorks, it can be a nightmare. There's a lot every of things. Every CAD program. Can every be CAD yep. program can be in a nightmare in its own way. It's things that don't talk trying to talk together. So. Yeah, it's, it's a computer trying to do a ton of math with very little information and. Yeah, it's like just the positive and negative side of a plane. Like, ever have had stuff do that where it just flips for no reason? Mm -hmm. Flip plane normal? Mm -hmm. Oh, God. Yeah. Well, that explain? It sounds... Don't worry. We'll get into that when we We'll get into that with SolidWorks. That's, solid, we shouldn't that's, touch that's that. modeling, yeah. you know, that's trials awesome. and tribulations, really. Um, that, that brings up a good point that I remember talking about is scan data is still very deceiving. Yeah. So you bring it into, you know, 3D space, and you're looking out on your computer... That's not enough information for your brain to really comprehend all the time. So, like, if I scan the back of a car for a trunk lip spoiler, I like having the taillights and the bumper and, like, the back of the car so I can visualize what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And You want something that's going to flow nice. So yeah, I some, want a, some kind of graphical... Just, I don't want to regret not getting it and, like, not right, being able to see the, the lines yeah. of the car or yeah. whatever it may be. But there's instances where you can get yourself flipped around and you're looking at it from what would be inside, <laughs> inside the car. Out, yeah and you can't tell the difference. Yeah. And your brain, once it sees it that way, is very hard to break it and get yeah. it right again. <laughs> so you have to really flip things around and it, it can really it's, play tricks with you. I mind. like to look away from the screen, flip things around and then come back and, and try to guess. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's no, the big problem with all those different software. It sure yeah. does. Um, and, and SolidWorks, for example, I mean, you have the option to turn on shadows and I mean, that's only as effective as all your light sources and everything, but that's a whole different ball game. But, you know, 
CAD software, it doesn't know shadows, it doesn't know depth or perception and things like that. So things look very strange, um, especially when you kind of get, you know, your brain's coordinate system kind of all jumbled up. So that's definitely a big hurdle to... For sure. Yeah. And that, I mean, that's another great reason why, you know, we go through all these steps and especially to 3D print an object so that we can lay it out and be like, okay, what I was looking at was real Mm -hmm. and it is the style I wanted it to be versus oh crap, this was not real, or I was looking at this other strange location. Yeah. Yeah. But It's also worth bringing up the different methods of scanning that we have you know, have come about now, because there's so many different levels. Like, we, Yeah, we use a pretty expensive piece of equipment to, to do our scanning, but there's levels all the way up, or all the way down, I guess, to cell phone... Yeah, pick, but it's picked, picked a gram. Uh, photogrammetry so pho- is the one that I'm familiar with. <laughs> oh, yeah, it rolls right off the tongue. Right, yeah. yeah. So that, that's the one. Um, it kind of makes sense though if you break it down. It does, yeah. but it, it just goes to say that technology is really moving up and advancing. I mean, the last people who five think years. this is unattainable right now, I mean, just give it a couple years. I mean, it's crazy because you know five years ago, you know we were using the red line laser, which really just couldn't handle glossy surfaces and everything. But that was state of the art at the time. And that was, was amazing. that was the best you could get. Like 3D printers now. Like so you can get everything. You can get a 3D printer on eBay for yeah. 150 bucks. Yeah, you buy a computer right. today, it's outdated in a month or two. Right. Like, it's crazy. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, you might be thinking about this and thinking, like, why do I care about 3D scanning? Like, this is never going to be applicable to me. But, I mean, there's, like, like Kevin mentioned, there's a there's a program floating around out there, or an app, I should say, called Photogrammetry that allows the user to take a hundred or so more, maybe, pictures of an object, and it is able to make essentially a 3D scan of that. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I can only imagine that in a year or two, that's going to be so much more refined. And, you know, 3D scanning, you know, whether or not it's with lasers or with photos, is going to be that much more attainable to, you know, the average hobbyist yeah. so I think it's important to start thinking about like <laughs> how just, can I use uh, this the the options and how much more how wow words are hard <laughs> but like just trying to how effective it is in terms of design yeah and how much better a product can be using 3d scanning and how much more efficient we are at it how the time yeah, it saves I mean, you can like, almost nail it the first time Nearly every time. Like, exactly. Yeah, if anything, it takes a minor tweak here and there after you get a first round. But, it's crazy because, right. I mean, we use them in conjunction, both the 3D scanner and the 3D printer. But in a way, the 3D scanner is almost, you know, making the 3D printer kind of unnecessary. It, it's very close. It's we just close. need the mental verification, yeah, more right. or less. It, it, because like we have the access to it. Though, right? Because you can double check your work. Because we have the yeah, access exactly. to that, it, it makes a it lot is. of sense. Like, and, and, just and let's be honest, yeah. the amount of time, right? So, like, you know, you said that, you know, you had, a, you were 3D printing a model for, what, 12 days once? And that yes. was, like, that's, that's like, pretty likely. But I feel like <laughs> it, it makes more sense to wait that 12 days and wait for that model to come out before you send an actual, you know, scan data I mean, to a vendor to... You wait months for someone else and to pay manufacture and thousands and thousands of dollars for right. a build type of right. something? Yeah. yeah. Months right, to so make it the first things. time, you yeah. figure out it doesn't fit, you have to figure out why it doesn't fit, convey that, you know, usefully to the vendor, right. and they have to try again, so and they again, have to imagine, modify their molds and do it again. Imagine yeah. that you didn't have the 3D scanner at all either, you right. know, in terms of having a part that didn't fit. Right, what are you doing, well, pictures again, and circling why stuff? why doesn't and, it fit? Right. 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 So, you, all this information and all this, you know, being able to, to take information from the car and images and scan data and points and everything is what makes manufacturing you know aftermarket stuff and you know parts and it makes it stuff. like profitable right because yeah. it saves time yeah. it saves money it yeah. saves effort but just it just makes sense in general i mean if you're gonna you know really any aftermarket parts company like i feel like they should be doing this well, that's all what it comes this. down to right is you're you're modifying stock parts right Right. whether it be an intake an exhaust or just adding a reinforcement bracket or something like that you're you're modifying something that already exists and so being able to design something that you know before this 
you know, uh, technology was available was, you know, maybe like a 20% success rate on like a prototype, you know, going up to like a 50% success rate on a prototype in terms of man hours, um, just capital expenses in terms of prototyping it or getting somebody to manufacture it and just cutting all of that stuff down, just time spent on it and being able to just more quickly arrive at a good product is this crazy that, well, on top of that, something we touched on at one point, but now we're doing this again, um, <laughs> is making things fit multiple platforms. Oh, the the ability is yeah, there. Yeah. Like, otherwise, you'd have to, you know, make a prototype or make it off of something. Mm-hmm. I don't know, either fabrication or what, and try to test fit it on different cars and figure out where all the interfer- right. ir- the interferences are. <laughs> wow. Um, <laughs> but like now, we can see it and we can adjust things. To a precision that honestly you could never do hand fabricating a part. Yeah, you can go like, scan five cars. Considerations. Like the, yeah. the, right. The, the TSI intake manifold, right? Sure. Were... You can go and scan five cars and know ahead of time what kind of little issues are going to be a problem on one car that might not be on another. Right. Like there might be like a vacuum hose somewhere. There. It's, right. it's so much more relevant when you're talking about shared components between different chassis. Like it could be a Honda, you know, because they share motors with like a million different things, right. or a Volkswagen or BMW or whatever. Um, but yeah, if you want to make an intake manifold that fits in an N54, you know, that's found in a 335, a 135, whatever, right. um, you have now the ability, instead of whipping up a prototype on, because you have access to one, a, a 135, uh, making the sheet metal thing, and then having to find a 335 and then going to put your, you know, hand fabricated, you know, prototype in the car to see if it fits, you have the ability to go scan both of them figure out what the common um, features are, which is usually the engine, (laughs) something like that. And you can, you can align all of that scan data to that feature that you know, that's going to remain constant and and be able to see virtually the difference. Because that could change everything. That changes your fastener strategy, depending on what's shared Mm -hmm. between the two. So if you make something, a whole whole might not even be there. Right. Exactly. Which we've definitely run into. Yep. And we've run into that on the same platform that's supposed to be the same <laughs> and there's some sort of yeah, year break that split. they didn't update yeah, and yeah, they it. change a grommet location mm-hmm. or a fastener and then you're screwed so like this is it still happens but the amount that we're able to save by yep. utilizing 3d scanning is and your your incredible. investment is nothing by scanning you know it's basically just it was time yeah just some time yeah. to to take something apart real quick and look at it essentially well, so. Yeah, I mean it's it's rare. It's even not necessarily it's not real super quick, invasive, but yeah. but right, yeah, the most invasive it is. We're using like, basic examples, intakes and exhausts and things like right. that. Not that difficult, but the worst I mean, is yeah. what the downpipe. What, what, downpipes can be real bad because up against the firewalls and things like that, you have to remove it. You basically you scan it installed, you scan it uninstalled, you scan it on the bench, and then you align. You know, to summarize, essentially all of those together. Right. Um, you know, and that's that's probably not even the most drastic I mean, example. It also allows for like bonus fitments. So sometimes yeah. you have something that's it's pretty raining really hard. <laughs> something that's pretty similar. <laughs> like I'll give an example of the B eight S four exhaust. Okay, that car is really really similar to the S five. Okay, what's the difference between difference between the two? Why doesn't it fit right away? You can scan the underside of the car and say, yeah. oh. This part needs to be three inches shorter. Now everything fits. Boom, bonus fitment. You have new application. Right. Yeah, I mean, you can take an already designed part, right, and essentially test fit it without having yeah, that's true. to or, do it. Or, yeah, I, mean, I do that in SolidWorks all the time. Yeah. You, see, you find a part that I designed that I think is similar. Yeah. You can throw it in there and be like, oh, it's exactly the same, or oh, it's completely different. We need a different perspective here. Yeah. It, you know, the amount of time that saves just in the project planning stage is incredible. Yeah. So yeah, three scanning, do it. <laughs> yeah, do it. <laughs> just do it. Guys. Just do it. Just do it. Definitely do Not, it. Yeah, I'm excited to see where it goes because it's already incredibly useful. Yeah, right. I'm, like I think manufacturing is gonna. I mean, it's been moving recently. I think it's only gonna get crazy. Yeah, and I, like I said, I mean, to kind of bring it full circle and more kind of relatable to probably our average listener, I think is. Um, yeah, I mean, we're definitely on the track to make this accessible to, like, right. the DIY user. I mean, it's pretty close. It's really, it's close. really close. Like, like I said, yeah. check out that app, uh, Photogrammetry. Um, it's, it's, it's wild what it's capable of. Of course, it's not as accurate. 
I mean, as you know, we're looking at thousands of a millimeter on our yeah, super but, like sixty thousand dollar ferro arm. But you know, for something, yeah. you know, maybe someone not that interesting. Like I have it. wanted to try it. It just seems. I say, if you, it, you know, maybe you try it out and we'll revisit it on a different. It can be daunting because, like we said in the beginning of this, like our scan data is really good, right? And the the post processing is what takes a lot of time, right. so I get a little nervous because the post processing on that. It's probably pretty bad. Um, it's probably a lot of like spec work. Trying I mean, to yeah. think about what's going to happen in five years, though. I, right now, but it's if, pretty yeah, introductory. Yeah, in five years, I if think you, it's gonna, they're going to nail it down. Right now, sure. though, if you spend five to ten grand on some kind of scanner, you can get a pretty solid setup. Oh, for sure, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't you don't have to go crazy. It's not that much money in the long run, of, considering what I mean, you get out of it. If you're producing product. Right, if you're a business, yeah, that's if you're, nothing. yeah, that's yeah. nothing. As long as you're not trying to do it at home in your garage, like, or if you just have the extra ten, fifteen grand. Like, <laughs> yeah, by all means, <laughs> I'm sure there's plenty. I would do. buy one for myself if right. I could. Yeah. It's on the it's list. Yeah, yeah, that would be nice. Just to be able to like, hey, I want to make this part. Just to not have to waste materials and just be able to get it that much closer the first yeah. try. Right. Yeah, it'd be huge. So, but anything else you want? To I don't know. I think, like, yeah, from here on out, it's we're going to touch on a lot of the 3D scanning ins yeah. and outs, I think, once we start talking about the modeling aspect of things right. Right. and this, how it's that all affects relevant. that. Um, but I think that's a pretty good intro. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, this is one of those things we're going to touch on through the rest of the steps of our process here. So we're going to bring it up again. and A lot. So, kind of trying to lay this, this out is, first. This is this hopefully clarifies. This some. is the roots of all of it. I yeah. mean, this is this is the starting point. Hopefully, yeah. I feel like episode seven and a half actually recorded. Here. There'll be some right. episodes with three D modeling. Yeah. There'll be some an episode on three D printing, mm -hmm. probably. Yeah. In, on its own, because there's. I think there's modeling is going to have to be broken up into different things yeah, too. There's so many right aspects of that. So yeah. Different. So. Yeah. Techniques and. Methods. But as far as three D scanning goes, I think that's. Yeah, we're just kind of scraping the surface by right. trying to give you the the whole meat of what we can on kind of our strategies. and Yeah, which is does. really difficult for us to do, honestly. I mean, we do this on a daily basis. Every single day we're dealing with scan data and, you know, 3D modeling and everything, just designing parts. And I think, um, you know, it's really easy for us to gloss over, you know, That's some of the fundamentals it. here. And so I think it's really important that we get listener feedback and say, hey, like, you know, what do you want to know more about? You know, what what did we glaze over? What's not clear? Um, and we're really anxious to have that feedback. So, so yeah, we're available. Yeah, we're available on uh, YouTube, Spotify, um, Instagram, Cat to Cars, Instagram, yep. Cat to Cars. Was, was Apple? Um, there's a, we're trying to open up uh, more forms of communication, more feedback um, on what you guys think of the episodes. And, and, uh, and so we can answer questions and try yeah. to be more clear. Like we said, this well, is stuff we do every day, yeah. and there's, it's easy for right, us to gloss over yeah, things yeah. that are worth going over. And yeah. you know, that and having somebody to talk to is nice too. Yeah, like say, you know, if, <laughs> I mean, you know, sad, I know, man. <laughs> you know, we're in quarantine, man. We got nobody to talk to. Uh, no, seriously, I think um, being able to answer questions give us gives us a good kind of structure to the podcast i right. think um well, i think there's a lot of people too that that may be able to you know test your brain um i would start with that. questions yeah right right like because yeah. obviously something that you do on a daily basis is essentially muscle memory right so you're exactly. Just like exactly going 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 but like there might yeah. be like in a small process that someone might have a question about that you could be like oh shit like i completely even if i don't even know the answer tests. yeah the right, challenge yeah. is awesome so um for sure, we're stay just tuned. we're just open to that feedback. Yeah. Yep, um, stay tuned. We're still trying to grow this thing and you know become more in touch with the listener base here. So yep, Cad to Cars Instagram that's new. We're gonna try and be posting um, some behind the scenes stuff, some uh, you know new episode releases, and you know whatever whatever we feel like. Yeah. So <laughs> so make sure you follow us at Cad to Cars on Instagram and follow DCS Tuning for obviously other updates on other things that are happening. Um, you guys said the first trip event is... Should be here. Should yeah, it should be on the 7th. So. Hopefully on the 7th. Uh, I know that we have, um, allegedly, Cars and Coffee will be on June 6th. Who knows? Oh, really? Oh, oh, really? Uh, but we're not sure. I think we're going to be here back from the health commissioner. 
certain things. Okay. Right. Uh, so we'll keep you updated with that. Stay tuned for more episodes. It's pouring outside. Talk to us, microphone. Very wet. Yeah. See you later. See you guys. Okay, bye. See ya.